Okay guys, finally, it's here. This is my official 2020 MacBook buying guide. So we're in May of 2020 and time just cannot slow down. It seems this whole quarantine has really messed with time. I can't believe it's already half the year. But guys, listen, I've heard you loud and clear. Deciding between which MacBook to buy is already frustrating as it is, and it's even harder trying to decide your configuration. See, the thing is, in case you didn't know, when you order a MacBook online through Apple.com, you have the option of improving its specs or technical specifications. So, in other words, you can add more storage, more RAM, or faster and better processors to make your computer more powerful. The aim of this video is to tell you everything you need to know about the MacBooks themselves to help you decide which model is right for for you. I already have some videos comparing and contrasting some of these models. For example, I have one on the 2020 MacBook Air i3 versus i5. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to go hard on some MacBook content, so definitely hit that subscribe button for future videos that go deep on comparisons between MacBooks, battery drain tests, and future unboxings. But today, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to take a close look at each model, including the Air, the Entry 13-inch Pro, the 4 USB-C 13-inch Pro, and also the 16-inch Pro so that you have a better idea of which computer is right for you. We'll keep testing and benchmarks to a minimum on this one as I'll go heavy on testing in the comparison videos coming up soon. This one is going to have tons of information so make sure you're cozied up and have some chips and maybe a drink nearby. You ready? Let's do this. Okay, where to begin? For this video, I'm going to try and make timestamps and pin it as a comment. That way you can fast forward to whatever section you are needing to know specifically about. Let's first start out with what's similar across all four machines. As you can see, all four machines are made out of this unibody aluminum chassis that just screams elegance and sophistication. I love grabbing my MacBook and just pressing the cold aluminum against my cheek. Please tell me I'm not the only one. Additionally, they all have this polished Apple logo here on the top and have now all done away with the glowing Apple logo of years past. Man, how I love that glowing Apple logo. It just made you feel like the cool kid on the block, am I right? All four computers come in the space gray or silver color options. But the Air one-ups them and also gives you the rose gold approach. It's this interesting brassy color. It's pretty dope in my opinion, but I guess they didn't cut the whole pro vibe. We then open up each computer to find uniformity across the board, thankfully when it comes to keyboards. Apple's entire lineup now did away with the god-awful butterfly keys and instead now opted for replacing each laptop with the Magic Keyboard, a much superior keyboard with much more travel and that in general is just more reliable and a much better typing experience. It uses scissor style keys that are just wonderful to type on, real snappy and bouncy response with each click of a key. All four feature a huge glass trackpad and all four have the Touch ID sensor used to unlock the computer. All but the Air have the OLED strip that looks super cool when first initially unveiled, but trust me, it's pretty much a gimmick. I only really use it on iMessage to send emojis if I'm being completely honest. Apart from the software features on the exterior, that's as far as the similarities go. Let's begin and start to talk about the design of each. The Air is the only model having this wedge shaped design, meaning it tapers and goes from wider to super skinny at its thinnest point. As the name would suggest, it's the lightest of all the laptops, coming in at only 2.8 pounds. This is incredibly light for a laptop, especially when directly comparing it to the 16-inch MacBook Pro that comes in at 4.4 pounds. And when carrying around a 16-inch Pro across campus, man, let me tell you, it really starts putting a strain on your back. But for the most part, the 16-inch Pro and 13-inch Pro feature the same chassis and design, just scaled up or down for the respective sizes in a way. So the Pros don't taper like the Air does, instead they're more of a rectangular shape and it just works. The nice aluminum feel all in a compact package that houses impressive power under the hood. It's no secret, I've said it before in prior videos, I think the 13 inch Pro is the best size, it's perfect. I just love how compact it is. The Pro and Air dimension wise are both super similar as both models fit into the same overpriced leather sleeve Apple offers. The 16 inch on the other hand does occupy way more space. So when purchasing your MacBook consider sizing as well. I've taken both the 16 inch and the 13 inch Pro onto planes back during the pre-Rona era and let's just say the 16 inch looks so huge and bulky resting on that tiny tray 
on the back of each airplane seat. It was so cumbersome to store and everything and also carry around. Yuck. No, sir. The 13-inch or Air are the best companions for flying without a doubt. Of course, that just goes to show there are some instances you'll prefer power and other times you'll want portability. Again, this is why I think the 13-inch is the best of both worlds. I think a big question most people ask is, how much does a MacBook cost? And you know, it's funny because to people who are not well versed in the Apple universe, the initial sticker shock is heavy. Pricing is all over the place since you can make several different combinations of built to order options. But I will at least provide the price of every model's base model and the max out configurations as well. As you can see, the Apple tax is well and alive on this one for sure. Apple computers aren't cheap by any stretch of the imagination. Currently, the cheapest MacBook you can get is going to set you back 10 Benjamins. That's right, folks, $1,000. And if you think that's a lot, wait until you see the price for the other models. The 13-inch Pro starts at $1,299 for the inferior base model with two USB-C ports or $1,799 for the much more powerful variant with four USB-C ports. But the Mac Daddy of them all, the 16-inch monstrosity has a base price of $2,400. Yes, I know, go ahead and say it, it is a ton of money. But if you really want to push it and are curious, a fully specced 16 inch MacBook Pro will cost you $6,099. What? And that's in the States. I can't even imagine overseas how much you guys are taxed. Let me know in the comments below. I'm actually quite curious. Needless to say, these are huge purchases, which is why you should be really informed when purchasing one. I think whatever model you decide, you will be pleased at the display quality of all four laptops. All of Apple's MacBooks feature that gorgeous retina display with vivid colors and super sharp resolutions. The Air and the 13-inch Pro see similar screen sizes measuring in at 13.3 inches diagonally, while the 16-inch Pro measures exactly at 16 inches diagonally. I'll throw up the specs and screen resolutions of each so that you can see the nitty gritty, but one thing I do want to point out is how the Air doesn't get as bright as the 13-inch Pros. The Air has a peak brightness of about 400 nits, while the pros do a better job sporting about a 20% increase, achieving a peak brightness of about 500 nits. This is actually a bigger deal than I expected, as outdoor work lately has become all too common for me now. I'll go outside a script just to get some fresh air and fresh oxygen to the brain, but sometimes that sun dough. Then you get those annoying glares and reflections and the extra 100 nits truly does make a difference outdoors. But if you're a student and plan to be indoors 99% of the time like I was when I was at university, then this shouldn't be too big of a deal for you as 400 nits is more than adequate for most indoor scenarios. Next up, and this is a big one, I want to talk about battery. Now, battery is almost always an interesting talking point amongst tech enthusiasts, especially when it comes to computers. The thing is, different applications consume different amounts of power, and each machine is going to have its own unique specs that will either enable or hinder its battery preservation. That's why it's always hard to guess at battery life sometimes, but for the purpose of this video, let's go with Apple's advertised times that I quite frankly think is a bunch of bull most of the time. But according to this, them, it seems the Air and the 16-inch Pro are both rated at 11 hours of wireless web browsing, while the 13-inch Pro is only rated at 10 hours. I don't know how to feel about this as it was very rare for me to ever squeeze out more than 10 hours out of these suckers so far. Now I don't have much to say about battery because again, everyone's use case are different, but definitely stay tuned because I will be filming and testing a MacBook battery drain test for 2020 very soon. Hint, hint, exit full screen and ring that subscribe button with bells so that you don't miss it. And and lastly, we get to the most difficult part of the buying process, performance. So, as I mentioned earlier in this video, I'll keep benchmarks to a minimum and focus more on in-depth performance testing in my head-to-head -head videos later on. But looking at Geekbench, across the board we can see an increase in score with each model, right? Like of course you'd expect the 16-inch Pro to be leagues ahead of the air. And it is, I mean check out these scores. Keep in mind though, the scores of the 16-inch MacBook Pro are super high because this is the maxed out configuration, all but the store Storage, but it is a good testament as to just how powerful the 16 inch beast is. We see the same when performing the Cinebench test. I did a video on the air and the thermal issues it's been having and it wasn't any different for this test. Cinebench is known to really crank the gear on these machines and max them out. The air's performance on this test was pitiful and took so long to complete. 
those fans were definitely cranked up. And lastly, here's some Heaven benchmarks for you guys. I really like Heaven because you can actually see the performance right in front of your very eyes instead of having to wait on a loading bar and for the test just to spit out a number. At least here, right next to each other at a normal speed, you can truly begin to see just how far behind the air lags behind even the 13 inch entry model. I mean seriously, this thing is struggling to even complete this test dropping frames left and right. The 16 inch as expected completely annihilated the competition. This maxed out model actually isn't too bad for gaming, despite MacBook's reputation for not being the best go to for gaming. It's obviously not going to give you the best performance like with some dedicated gaming laptops, but it's still pretty impressive. Those are the big things, at least, but there's still so much more. The FaceTime camera is still sh if I'm going to be quite honest. Hard to believe in 2020 Apple is still pulling this, but it gets the job done on a typical FaceTime call. Your internet is probably sh anyway, so it'll be laggy and pixelated, so I mean, it's fine. Just use your iPhone if you want good selfies, I guess. I don't know, Apple definitely needs to upgrade their laptops in this department. As I said earlier, all four models now sport the much better and more reliable butterfly keyboard, but you'll notice that flanked to either side of the keyboards are the speakers. All of the model speakers are surprisingly good for their size, the Airs being the worst while the 16-inch Pro having a pretty rad setup when it comes to audio. But in all honesty, all of them sound great. Microphone quality is acceptable. I know for a fact that was much improved on the 16-inch. I did a full review on that back when it came out and showcased the mic quality as compared to the previous 15-inch model. The difference was night and day, but either way, microphone quality was always acceptable, I guess, but let's be realistic. You'll probably be buying an extra microphone to record audio anyway, but I guess if you truly have nothing, the microphone quality on either of these machines should be good enough. Wow, is that everything? Let me see, design, price, I think that's everything, for the most part. Man, I know that was a lot of info. If you were looking for super deep testing of these machines with benchmarks and raw numbers, stay tuned as I'm going to do my deep comparison video on a few of these machines to see if the price is justified for a beefier computer or whether you would be okay with something cheaper like an Air or Entry Pro. The aim for this video was to give a broad overview of each and what each has to offer. I guess if I had to summarize these computers, it'd be like this. The Air is great for your everyday tasks. It's lightweight and portable with some of the best battery life the MacBook line has to offer, and it makes it great for students. Majority of students will only be browsing the internet, maybe some Microsoft Word and PowerPoint here and there, and emails. Definitely not the move for gaming or heavy workloads like photographers or video editors. You won't get a touch bar here, but I doubt many will care, and you do get the extra color choice being rose gold, which is really nice. I wish the rose gold was featured on the Pros. Then comes the Entry 13-inch Pro, and it is better than the Air in many ways. It has a brighter display and offers better performance over the Air. The chassis is also thicker, making thermal throttling a non-issue for the most part on this computer. It is quite sad though because these entry 13-inch Pro models still sport older 8th gen chips and didn't get updated to the 10th gen chips. This was done presumably to save on cost, but either way, not too happy about it. This makes this a harder computer to recommend. I would say students who do like coding or those who have a hobby for photography or even music creation could benefit from this computer over the air. But if you do need that extra power, Apple has you covered with the 13-inch Pro with the four USB-C ports. Not only is this a big advantage hardware-wise so you can connect multiple external devices simultaneously, but this more expensive model does feature those newer 10th gen chips and better specs all around. Only downside is on the 13-inch line, we don't get a dedicated graphics card, but this model does prove to bring some serious potential to the table. Plus, I've always said, this form factor is the best in my opinion. And finally, saving the best for last, we have the 16-inch Pro. For those with big passions for their creativity, this is the one for you. The power behind the computer is exceptional and has way more configuration options including a whopping 64 gigabytes of RAM and up to an AMD Radeon Pro 5500M, making this pretty suitable for even gaming. It has that much larger 16 inch display, more graphics power and more storage. It's the go to Apple MacBook for serious professionals and those needing as much power as possible. Well guys, I really hope this video helped some of you guys make a better decision. Trust me, I remember when I bought my first MacBook Pro. It was a stock based model, but I was still ecstatic. If you're still unsure, here are my at handles. Feel free to message me with your unique use case and I'll try to make a recommendation for you based off what you tell me. Please be patient as I reply to these in chronological order, but hopefully I get to yours quickly. Anyway guys, like I said, stay tuned for a ton of MacBook content real soon. And as always, take care of yourselves and each other. The world is a little crazy right now. Peace out.